We have reached, or will, by the time this, is, uh, this message is over with, we will have reached the end of chapter 3 of Romans, and I hope you have enjoyed it. As I said when we first started this particular chapter, as we continue to make our way through the entire letter, that any question that you could possibly have about salvation is actually answered in that one chapter. There's only 30 some odd verses in there. Um, but there's nothing that's, that's left to chance. There's nothing left to, for us to wonder about. It's one of the makes it one of the most extraordinary chapters in all of Scripture because it talks about the very essence of salvation. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Everything that we could possibly want to know. Now, of course, I've expounded on it in other parts of Scripture as well, but if I had to pick one chapter that explains it in its totality, it would be this chapter. And, and as I looked at the end of it, I, I, I saw something interesting. I'd read the chapter many times before, but I don't think I noticed this before, which is really one of the cool reasons why we should continue to read things that we are familiar with, to be honest with you. We can never be so familiar with God's Word that we won't see something that we've seen before. One of the things I found interesting about this is, in a, in a, this is kind of a weird analogy, but bear with me. Uh, chapter 3 is kind, of, is kind of like a salvation sandwich. Uh, it, it really is. When you look at the entire chapter and all of the extraordinary things that God is telling us in there about the very nature of salvation, why it happens, how it happens, uh, under what circumstances it happens, what it is, what it's not, I notice that the chapter begins and ends the exact same way, which is kind of interesting. When that happens, we probably should pay attention to that. It starts out by telling us there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. It ends by telling us there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, and then everything else is kind of crammed between that. But you know, you know what makes a sandwich? It's the bread. If not, it would just be the meat or whatever, peanut butter and jelly, whatever happens to be in the middle of it. We kind of take the bread for just kind of there. But we can't do that with this. There is a reason why Paul is doing this. There's a reason why God inspired him to start this amazing chapter on salvation the, the same way that he ends it. And it is the struggle that I have seen. It is, an, for lack of a better word, an infection that I continue to see, even in evangelical churches all across this country. We still have, we have the data that shows it over and over again. And that is this idea that there is actually something we can do to take part in our salvation. That there is some work that we can do or series of works that we can do when he starts out and he ends up by telling us the same thing. And that is there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Nothing. Zip. Zero. Zilch. Nothing. And I know that sounds basic. But if it's so basic, why do so many people continue to struggle with that? He wants us to understand, before he gets into the meat of the message in this chapter, he wants us to understand at the beginning, at the end, that if we miss this, we're going to miss everything in the middle. Christianity is the religion, for lack of a better word, on the planet, by the way. You know, there are a gazillion different religions. In the world. And they're all very different in a lot of different ways. But the one thing they all have in common, other than Christianity, is the fact that you have to work toward the God or gods of that particular. You have to do something for them in order for them to do something for you. Christianity stands alone in that. In Islam, it's the five pillars of Islam. Everybody's supposed to do those five things. In Buddhism, it's the Eightfold Noble Path. You have to do those things. In Hinduism, it's the idea of karma. In order for good things to happen to you, you have to do the good things first, and then you will get rewarded for that. Even in Judaism, it's adherence to the law. You have to do these things. It is an infection that has, unfortunately, crept into the Christian church as well, specifically evangelical churches. And we have to understand this or we're going to miss salvation. We will miss it. There is not one single thing we can do. And yet, it is inaccurate to say that works have nothing to do with salvation at all. It's one of the great dichotomies in all of Scripture. 
In fact, you've heard me reference this passage many times. I've referenced it many times as we've been going through chapter 3. I'm going to read it again. I want you to hear the obvious dichotomy that is put into these verses here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. He is telling us very clearly we cannot work for our salvation. In the very next verse, in, in verse 10 of that same chapter, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You, you see the interesting juxtaposition there. No works, no works, no works, no works, do works. It's interesting, isn't it? I'm, I, you guys may know this, you may not know this, but I am fascinated with language. Not languages per se, I only know one. But I'm fascinated with language, I'm fascinated with the communication of information. Words are very, very powerful things. It's words that are in God's Word. How did God create the universe? With words. Spoke it, literally spoke it into existence. In John's Gospel, in the first chapter, how does he describe Jesus? What name does he use as he called Jesus? He calls him the Word. It is amazing to me how we will take some that so much can hang on just a few simple little words. In this particular case, with this idea of works related to salvation, the entire thing can be explained or differentiated between two small, what we might consider insignificant, throwaway words. They're both prepositions. Oddly enough, they both almost have the exact letters in different orders, but they carry a completely different meaning. What am I talking about? I'm talking about what the Scripture is talking about. I'm talking about what that passage in Ephesians that we just read is talking about. We do not work for our salvation. However, we do work from it, for and from, words that we use a gazillion times a day, never giving any meaning to it, everything, any thought to it at all. But look at, the, look at what's hanging on those words. And like I said, with the word from, it, it has the same letters, word for, in a different, different order with a, with a letter tacked on. The, the, the idea of language and what it communicates is so vitally vitally important to us. And if we miss this, I know this sounds like a subtlety, but it's not. It is foundational to understanding what God does when he saves us. They had trouble with this. Obviously, this is not a 21st century problem. They had the same problem in the first century. If you read the letter to the Galatians, Paul is talking about a group of people that are referred to as the Judaizers who said, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus died on a cross and he rose again and you should believe that and you should embrace that. But... And any time you put a but after that statement, there's a problem. But you also have to be circumcised and you have to keep the, the dietary food laws. You see that? We have to, there's work added in there. When we do that, when we believe that, if we think that there's some work we can do to earn God's love or earn His salvation, earn His grace, ultimately what we're saying is the cross is not enough. It was incomplete which of course is not the case, three of the last words Jesus ever spoke on the cross were, it is finished, it is completed. But there is that continual tension for believers and this understanding of what role that works play, not in attaining our salvation, but from living it out. And that's exactly how he finishes up here. He is telling us in no uncertain terms in these last five verses that we cannot work for our salvation, but there is an expectation that we will work from it. And that's what we're going to look at here today. So if you have your Bibles, we are, of course, in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 27 through the end of the chapter in 31. The version, I don't know if I've ever told you, the version I use is the ESV. You can use whatever version you want, but if it sounds a little different than yours, that's probably why. So beginning in verse 27 of Romans chapter 3, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not 
the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us here this morning. Lord, may your Holy Spirit have free reign in this place today. May you be lifted up and glorified and people be drawn unto you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So this is what we're going to look at. Just two points that he's making here in these five verses. And it's the ones I've said before. We don't work for our salvation. We do work from our salvation. So let's start with the first one. And that is, we see in verses 27 through 30, that we do not work for our salvation. Again, in verses 27 through 30, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He has said this three different ways in two verses. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. What Paul is doing here is he is addressing two fallacies that we have, uh, that we have briefly mentioned. We're going to go into a little more detail now. And the first fallacy that he is addressing here is this idea that we can somehow do enough good things in order for God to love us, to reward us, to honor us in some way. And it is a fallacy. It is not true. When you ask people today, and I mean a broad spectrum of people, churchgoers, non-churchgoers, believers, unbelievers who may, because the vast majority of people, the, the data I've seen, the, 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 uh, the uh, surveys that I've seen, still say the vast majority, vast majority of people in this country believe in God. Uh, they believe that there's a heaven. It's interesting. A lot of the people who believe in heaven don't believe there's a hell, which is kind of interesting. But a lot of people believe in heaven. Even people who are not churchgoers, even though people who are, who are not even maybe consider themselves uh, Christians specifically, do have this general idea that when people die that there is a place that they go to that's a lot better. When you ask those folks, how do you get to heaven, what is the answer you're going to get? Be a good person. Do good things. That is the answer you get over and over and over again. That is the philosophy of the world, such as there is one related to the afterlife, is that if there's a heaven, even if people don't believe there is, but hypothetically would believe there might be a heaven, and you could talk to a person and say, okay, I know you don't believe there's a heaven, but if there were, how would you think they would get there? They would answer it the same way. Be a good person and do good things. And that's their philosophy. You know, every single person on the planet has a philosophy of life. Everybody. Believer, unbeliever, different religions, doesn't matter. Everybody has a way that they think the world works. Here's an interesting thing about philosophies. They are useless if they don't work in the real world. They're useless. Can we agree with that? There's a, a movie uh, about the Civil War that came out some years ago called Gods and Generals. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's an interesting part at the beginning of the movie. One of the guys, one of the characters, Joshua Chamberlain, if you're a historian, you know, you like that kind of stuff. He was the guy who was the hero of Little Round Top at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was actually a philosophy professor before he went into the war. And the movie starts out with him talking to his class about philosophy. And in one of the most brilliant questions I've ever heard uttered from a character in a movie or a TV show was uttered in that scene. One of his students raises his hand and he said, where does the study of philosophy intersect with the real world? I thought, what an extraordinary question that is. I don't think the writers realize. <laughs> how extraordinary that question is. That is the ultimate question. If I have a philosophy of the world, but then when it intersects the world, it doesn't work, it's a useless philosophy. Can we put to death today, here, on this glorious Sunday morning, that horrendous philosophy that in order to get to heaven, you have to be a good person or do good things? Can we finally do that today? Because as a philosophy, it doesn't work. 
It doesn't even make sense any sense. Even though the world will say that makes more sense than Jesus dying on the cross and redeeming us from our sin. It does on the surface. Sounds like it might be a little simpler, right? Do good things go to heaven. Do bad things you don't go to heaven. Simple enough. I've done this before. It's been a while, but I want to ask some questions related to that philosophy so we can see if it actually makes sense at all. So the first question we have to ask is, what is a good thing? Who defines that? Can we even define what a good thing is? A few summers ago, people were burning businesses to the ground, and they said that was a good thing. Most of us would probably think that was not a good thing, but it doesn't matter to them it was. We can't even define what actually a good thing is. Let me ask you this. Are good things that we do weighted? Are some better than others? And do they count differently? If I see somebody struggling with packages out to their car and I help them to their car, I think we could probably all agree that that's a good thing to do. If later on somebody else rescues 10 children out of a burning building, that's a good thing. Are they the same? In other words, how many people do I have to help out to their car to make up for the, the guy who saved 10 people from a burning building? Is that how it works? Or they all waited the same? That's a legitimate question, right? What's, what's good? What's, oh, I got even better for you. Here's a really good one. What if I have the opportunity to do a bad thing and I don't do it? Is that a good thing or is that just a thing? See, I, and uh, how do you ever know? What's the ratio? Is it one more good thing than the bad things you did? Is it 10 more? Is it 100 more? It doesn't work. It doesn't even make any sense. We can't even answer simple questions related to the thing that's supposed to get us to heaven. And that is exactly what Paul is talking about here. Look at the verbiage. Then what becomes of our boasting? I love that opening statement because he's saying a couple of things. It sounds like, first of all, that he's familiar with people who've been boasting about their salvation. What then becomes of our boasting, almost as if he's heard people doing this. The second thing he seems to be implicitly saying here is that if we could work for our salvation, it would definitely be something worth boasting about. If salvation is the most important thing that can happen to a human being, and it is in the entire universe, the redemption of our souls, the forgiveness of our sin, the adoption by the holy God of the universe. It is the single most important, amazing thing that can ever happen to a human being. And if I could work my way toward that, if I could do enough things to do that, you're doggone right I should be boasting about that. But he says you can't. Because there's nothing to boast about. Because you didn't do anything. Not only did you not, and please mis don't misunderstand me. It's not that you didn't do those things. It's that we can't. It is literally impossible. We have never. We will never want to. No matter how long we live, we could never do enough good things. And he talks about that by a law of, uh, of what kind of law? He's talking about a little bit of a philosophical argument here. By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. How do we get faith? Well, that's a gift too, something we can't work toward. It can grow in us as a believer, as it should, but the gift, the, the, the faith is actually a gift itself. If there was one passage that I could give you that shows you exactly how God sees our good works apart from Him, it would be Isaiah 64.6. God tells us, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Every single good thing we do apart from Him, He views as filthy rags. Now please, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that in the world, in our environment, in our culture, that we don't rate those things differently. We look at what some people do and say that's a good thing that person did. That's the worldly standard. That's the earthly standard. But we're not talking about the world standard, are we? We're not talking about it. We're talking about how God sees our so-called good works. And since we're close enough to lunch, I'm not going to tell you the mental picture that's supposed to come to mind when he refers to the filthy rag. It's, it's pretty gross. So we'll just leave it at that. I think filthy rags is enough. 
That is the way that he sees our works. It's the only way he will ever see our works. There is not one amazing thing we can do on this planet apart from him that everybody else would be considered good that would earn his love or his grace or his mercy or his salvation. We have to understand this. We have to get that. So he, he, he first addresses the fallacy of good works and then he addresses the fallacy that is always connected to it and the fallacy of being a good person. A few months ago, and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just, you, look, they said it. I'm just telling you what the person said. You can come to your own conclusion, conclusion if you would like. Just a few months ago, the Pope was doing an interview with somebody. And in that interview, he said that every human being was born basically good. The idea being that we have this innate goodness in us and all that... Jesus does is draw out that innate goodness that has been pushed way to the back, way down in our lives, our beings, our souls, for lack of a better word. And that God draws that out. There's only one gigantic, humongous problem with that statement. It is 100% completely unbiblical. It is the exact opposite of what Scripture says. In fact, in this very chapter, earlier in this very chapter, Paul quotes an Old Testament passage where God says there are none good, no, not one. I've shared with you before the survey that I saw some time back and it was a survey of evangelical, evangelical Christians that had the question on there, and all you were supposed to answer is whether you agree with this statement or you don't agree with this statement. And the statement is, I think people are born basically good. 80%, as much as it hurts my heart to tell you this, 80% of evangelical believers agreed with the statement that people are basically good. As far as the world's concerned, maybe we are. Maybe we are. Maybe you could make that argument. But that is not what Scripture says about us from an existential standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint. There is no such thing as a good person. Not according to God, not according to Scripture, because His standard is what? His standard is perfection. If you ask that very same person, do you think there's any perfect person on the planet, they would probably, all every single one of them would say, oh, well, no, of course not. Well, that's the standard. That's God's definition of good, is perfect. And if we miss this, this is why Paul started with it, it's why Paul ended with it, if we miss this, we will miss the totality of salvation. In fact, we have an example of that. You've heard me refer to this. This is one of the most important interactions that Jesus ever had with another human being. I'll read the version in Mark chapter 10. And as I read it, you'll, it probably will be very familiar to me. I want you to listen very carefully to what this person says and what Jesus says as a result. And as he, meaning Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit... Uh, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your mother and father. And he said to them, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is, of course, the interaction he had with, and Matthew referred to as the rich young ruler. And you notice his question was based on this fallacy that Paul was just debunking here in this passage that the rest of the scripture debunks as well. That is, I can do enough good things or be a good enough person in order for me to be able to go to heaven. And instead of debating him about all of this other stuff, what is Jesus' first response to him? 
There is none good but the Father. This kid thought, this person thought, that his biggest problem was that he needed to be a better person. He'd already done good things. He said that. He bragged about it. All of these I've kept from my youth. I don't know if I quite believe that, but in his mind, that's what he was thinking. All of these I've kept from my youth. But when you go back to the beginning of what Jesus responded to him was, he knew that they were never going to get anywhere unless this person knew that they were not a good person, that only God alone was good. And as a result of being so locked into this idea, by the way, I still think the greatest trick that our enemy has ever portrayed on, on, on uh, humanity is convincing people they're basically good. I believe that is the most diabolical thing that he has ever inflicted on humanity, is that he has convinced people that you're basically good because when you're basically good, all you need is a little help. You don't need a savior. You don't need transformation. You just need some help. And what he is showing us here as he's taking these two fallacies, because what do you call a person that does good things? You call them a good person. And we live under the guise of this fallacy that if we are good enough, God will love us. If we are good enough, He will reward us. And the scripture tells us over and over and over and over and over again, that is not true. And you want to see the consequences of not understanding that's true? Look back at this rich young ruler who walked away from salvation because he thought he was a good person. He didn't hear what he wanted and he got disgruntled and he walked away. He missed it. That's how important this is. If we don't see this, we miss salvation. There is... I, I, it, no different than that doctor hitting you on the, on, the, on the knee with your leg popping out. It's not, is it going to happen? It might happen. Sometimes it happens. It will happen. You will miss that. I would have missed that. God saved me. The first thing that popped into my head was all of the things that I had been doing wrong my entire life. I didn't fight against it. I didn't buck against it. I saw it. I knew it, I recognized it, and I was a decent guy. I was not a bad guy, not in the way the world would look at it. And I thank him for that, <laughs> almost every day of my life for revealing that sin to me, for making me see who I truly, truly was, so that I would need him. I got some really bad news for you and for me. We are not good. We're not. We do not do good things. You want to know the good news? God loves us anyway. He sent his son to die for a not good person, <laughs> for a whole bunch of not good people who do not good things. And that is the reason why he is telling us this. And so he is making it very clear in these first four verses that we do not work for our salvation but he's also making it very clear in this last word, verse that we do work from our salvation. Verse 31. Remember he's talking about the law here. And what does he tell us about the law? Can you be saved by following the law? No, you can't. But then listen to what he says here. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. I say, okay, wait a minute. Now you just told me I can't do the works of the law to be saved. And then I'm saved, I'm upholding the law. What, what in the world is he talking about here? He's talking about the same thing he says in a lot of other passages. A few I want to read here to you. John 14, 15, if, just as Jesus speaking, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Ephesians 2, 10, I'll read that again. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus in Matthew chapter 17, verses 15 through 20, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs or from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And of course, in the famous Matthew 25 chapter, 
Beginning in verse 35, when Jesus says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of these, the least of my brothers, you did it to me. You see this over and over and over and over again. We do not work for our salvation. It is absolutely expected that we will work from our salvation. The law does not save us. It cannot save us. You know what happens when we get saved? We want to do the law. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the desire we're supposed to have in our heart. Those are the actions we are supposed to take. I said last week, and I, and I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't miss, misspeak or, or, or communicate to you the wrong idea, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it again and, and hopefully maybe explain it a little bit better than I did last week. If you're a believer, I can tell you one thing for certain, a whole bunch of things, but for our purposes today, just one. God did not save you to carry out your tasks from an earthly standpoint on this planet. To have your job, to do your job well, to have a family, to raise your family, does He give us those things? Yes, of course He does. They are a tremendous blessing to us. But God did not save us in order for us to be really good at our job. Really good at paying off our mortgage. Really good. Oh, those are all important things. Do not mishear me. Those are all important things. They're a part of what God has blessed us with that allowed us to be able to do. But He did not save you or me for that. He saved you and He saved me to do His work on this planet. To do His work. Those good works He's talking about, that's what He's talking about. That's why He saved us. I still find it amazing that he could use any of us. You ever have that thought? Does that ever thought ever cross your mind? The God of the universe who spoke existence into being can use me to help accomplish his will to do those works he's talking about? Don't you wish, by the way, that there was one verse, just one verse, in Scripture that would tell us exactly what God wants us to do. Do you wish that? Your wish is about to come true. Because He does. In no uncertain terms, He does. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has told you, O oh man and woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? My goodness, we should pause right there to understand the gravity of that statement. If you were ever wondering what God requires of His people, He's about to tell you. In one verse, no less. That's pretty cool. What does God require of me? How many times have we asked Him that question? God, what do you want me to do? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Isn't it interesting that the first one he chooses there has the word do in it? What does he require of me? What do we do now? And I mean now, after we're saved. We certainly can't work for our salvation. What does he want us to do? To do justly. His justly. In everything that we do, which includes being a husband, being a wife, being a daughter, being a son, being an employee, being a business owner. All of those other things kind of fall under that. To love mercy, to love kindness, and to walk, not just walk with God, to walk humbly with our God. This is what He wants us to do. This is what it looks like in our lives. It applies 
to everything. It applies to big things. It applies to small things. It applies to everything in between. All of what we do in the works of God, no matter what size they are, what component they are, it's ministry. You're working for Him. Again, no matter how big, we think of big, we think somebody like Billy Graham. Right? You know, Billy Graham, he's reached millions of people all around the world. It's hard to find an evangelist in the history of Christianity that has had much impact as Billy Graham did. So we have a tendency to think like that. But then there's the other side of that spectrum. The other side of that spectrum is, hey, what about the guy who invited him to the service where he got saved? You see what I'm talking about here? We have a tendency to think that we're, well, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to do the works he's called me to work. That they say, oh, I'm afraid to do that because I might end up in some, you know, third world country as a missionary. All right, maybe, but probably not. That's the big thing that we're, we're talking about. What about the everyday things, the everyday works that he gives us? In Galatians 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In Romans 12, beginning in verse 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts or encourages in his encouragement, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is regular, everyday stuff. Regular, everyday stuff that we can do that are works he's called us to do. Is that what we're doing? Or have we gotten saved, and it's easy to fall into this, or have we gotten saved and say, okay, I guess I'll hang around until Jesus calls me home. He did not save you for that. He didn't. He did not save you to sit around and wait for him to call you home. The work we're supposed to do from a secular standpoint is extremely important. The kingdom work is even more important. It's the only thing that lasts. And he wants us to do it. He has invited us into this arena. So as I said earlier, to say that works has nothing to do with salvation in any way, shape, or form is not true. Works are a very, very big, important part and related to salvation. But it is work from our salvation, not for our salvation. Just as I've said before and used this analogy many times, just like an apple tree that doesn't produce apples is no longer an apple tree. It's just a tree. So it is with the person who doesn't produce fruit. They're not a believer. Please, please don't misunderstand me. I am not, nor would I ever encourage you to think for a moment, to come up with a list of things that you have to go out and do or God's going to be mad at you. I've got this long list here. I've got to check it off. God's going to be mad at me if I don't do this stuff. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not adding on to it. We're talking about a way of life for the believer is a way of life of service that covers so many things. We see this, and for the unbeliever, because now we've read it, we're on the hook. Right? What are we going to do about this now that we have read this and understand this? For the unbeliever, it's simple. It is a clear attempt by God to let us know that there is no amount of work we can do to earn God's salvation and that it is completely a gift from Him. For the believer, we need to do the work that He's called us to do. Do the work. He has called you to do. And just because it's not something big doesn't mean it's not work. 
Exercise the gifts, both individual and corporately. I was talking to somebody about this the other day, about how amazing it is we have here at, at, uh, at Harmony. How many people it takes to do what we're doing. Doing the sound, looking after the kids, teaching the kids, teaching Sunday school, setting all of this stuff up, tearing all of this stuff out. You know what that is? That's ministry. That's, that's the work of God. This is, <laughs> nobody's asking anybody to, to, you know, to go to a third world country to be a missionary. That's not the only way you can serve. We work very hard. And by the way, again, let me give you my disclaimer. There's nothing wrong with this. I worked hard when I was in the Navy. You work hard at your job. That's great. Fulfills the scripture. Work as if working to the Lord, right? I get that. I understand that. And we worry about the work that we're going to do, and we worry about what we're going to do when we get there, and I want to make a good impression, and I want to get promoted, and I want to do all of the things, and there's nothing wrong with that. When is the last time that we've asked ourselves the question, what work have I done for God? What work have I actually done? Because the expectation is that we will work from that salvation. God's not going to love us anymore if we do the work. He's not going to love us any less if we don't. This is not about that. This is about doing the work that God has called us to do, that we have to answer questions on a regular basis. And the question is, what should I be doing for him? What fruit am I producing? And why am I not doing any of the work? Those are legitimate questions. What that looks like for you, that's between you and God. I could certainly help you with that. That's part of my job is to help you with that. And the Pharisees came and told Jesus to tell his disciples to be quiet. You remember, of course, that great response that he gave. If these are quiet, the very rocks will cry out. I don't think he, that was hyperbole. I don't think that was, you know, figure of speech. I think he literally meant that. If these are quiet, if I make these people be quiet, if they do not praise me, the very rocks will cry out my name. And what I have always said is, that makes us as about as useful to God as a box of rocks. He does not need us. He doesn't need anything. It's a lot better than that. He wants us. What works? Jesus said, don't build up treasure in heaven. You know why? Because it rusts. And the moths come and they eat it up. It doesn't last. I did not, you know... I did not, Peter's passage was perfect today. We did not coordinate that. I had no idea what he was going to read. It was the exact same thing. What are you really working at? Is it something that the rust is going to come get? Is it something that the malls are going to eat? I would tell you a story about, uh, I don't know if you guys realize this, but some people in the Marine Corps break the rules. You guys familiar? I know. Weird, right? You guys, you guys break, the, break the rules all the time. I was sitting in my office one day, and I looked out the window, and a guy was pulling into one of the parking spaces, and I knew this kid's car because it was a bright yellow Camaro. And the guy's pulling into the car spot next to the bright yellow Camaro, and he hit the car. He hit the door on the side. Now, I'm already having a, um, a mental bet with myself. This kid's going to leave. That's what I thought to myself. This kid's not going to stick around. He ran to this car. Nobody saw him. At least he thought nobody saw him. So he's going to be on his way. And sure enough, he puts that thing in reverse. He backs out. I had already written down his license plate number, so he was going to be in a world of trouble. And then he did the right thing. I saw him go back. He could tell the hesitation. He was driving a car. He was thinking about it. Right? Am I going to go? Am I going to stay? I better do the right thing. So he pulls in, he goes in and finds the kid. And I remember the conversation with the kid. I don't even remember the guy who hit the car, but I remember the conversation with the kid. He, was, he couldn't have been more than 21, maybe. I'm sure he had drastically overextended himself with that car because I knew what he made. And he's just ranting and raving about this guy hitting his car. I just got this thing. I put a dent in it. I, you know, all this other stuff. 
And so I, I, I saw him and I said, yeah, I saw the guy do it. I had written his tag down because I thought he might leave and all this other stuff. And I said, uh, I said to him, I said, you know that car's going to end up in the, in the junk heap one day. Mm. So you realize that, right? <laughs> all of this effort and time and energy you are placing into this thing, the junkyard is full of cars that people felt the very same way about when they got there. I was trying to get him to see a little bit of the, a little bit of the bigger picture here. Because that is a picture of what we do. We worry so much about these things, these earthly things, that are not going to last. Not going to put a statue up to me anywhere. Or more than likely you. When we waltz away from this planet, we'll have the people who loved us and the people that knew us who still hang on to those memories and those thoughts. But the stuff we did, you think anybody, I did 20 years in the Navy. Literally, blood, sweat, and tears poured out into that job. I guarantee you there's not a single person in that organization that remembers me. That loved me, yeah, but they don't remember me. Why would I spend that much time and effort into something nobody's going to remember? That's not going to have the impact of transforming people's lives. I want to do what God wants me to do in order for, to propagate his gospel. That's what I want to do. You heard those fruits of the Spirit. Encouragement. Giving somebody a glass of water, what Jesus said. You visited me when I was in prison. You gave me food when I was hungry. We think of those things as being nothing. They're not nothing. They are the works that God has called us to do in order to glorify Him. What are you doing for Him? What kingdom work are you doing? What kingdom work am I doing? I want to ask myself that question every day. I could just literally float through life apart from these Sunday mornings. Float through life and not give a second thought to that. I'm ashamed to tell you there have been too many times I have done that. But what's going to last? What's really going to mean something? So as much as we cannot work for our salvation, the other side of that coin is just as important and that we work from it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord, to come into your house, to sing praises to you, to worship you, to read your word, Lord, to talk about your word, Lord. And my prayer is for me, Lord. It is for me. I want to think about your works all the time. I want to do your works all the time, big, small, in the middle. Lord, I just want to do what you want me to do. I want to do justly, and I want to love mercy, and I want to walk humbly with you. I want to do the things that are going to last, the things that are going to mean something to honor and glorify you, and not just worry about the things of this world, as important as they are sometimes, Lord, to always keep them in the proper perspective and the proper order. Lord, I pray that you would burden each and every, the heart of each and every believer in here this morning, Lord, that we will go out from this point forward and think every single day, what kingdom work can I do today? Lord, and I know your word tells us it could be something as simple as calling somebody up and offering them a word of encouragement, especially a fellow believer who's struggling. It might be something big, Lord. That, I leave that to you and to us. I just pray that we have a heart to serve you, to do the works that are expected and that should come as natural to us as breathing so that you would be honored, you would be glorified, and you would be lifted up. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.